next screen we'll look at is the goose, the gooses. Under the goose subheading, we have uh, TX Goose and RX Goose. TX is the publishing, RX is the subscription. Let's start with the TX Goose first. When we expand on this, there are 16 goose messages that we can publish. Let's open this up. And in here, we'll go through the menu structure quickly. Uh, the mode, basically disabled, is means just that. It's turned off. We have uh, a couple of different modes. One is the goose, the standard goose, and then the routable goose. If we select the goose, it gives us this information. The next field that we look at here is the goose control block. You can see there's a maximum number of 32 characters. This uh, goose control block is a, just a, a reference as per the standard. The goose ID is the actual name of the, the goose that we're looking for. Um, so the goose ID is the, is the name of, that the subscribers are looking for that they want to subscribe to. So this is very important. You can see the field size is 129 characters on that. The next field we'll look at is the, the data set. In here, we have a choice of either TT6 data sets or TT3. There are six uh, TT6 data sets and there are 12 TT3 data sets. Now, the difference between the two are this, is that the TT6 are known as our fast data sets. And when we populate a goose message with the fast data set, then it's considered a fast goose. If we populate it with a TT3, then this is considered a, a slow data set and a slow and a pop makes the makes it a slow goose. Uh, so this is typically used for analog and non-mission critical type signals. So let me come back to the to TT6. I'll show you how this works. So as we come in here, you'll see the the name update as well. We can also change this. So this could be, we could call it something such as trip, a trip signal. You can see, we see the identification of the relay. We have our six um, logical devices. And from here, we can pick and choose. We can populate the data sets by dragging and dropping. So if we want to do something such as, uh, let's say, protection, I'll just grab a copy here, go down to, say, phase IOC, for instance. down to the status. Come to operate, I can grab any one of these particular objects. So let's say I grab general, drag it over, I can grab the quality bit, and I can also grab the, the timestamp. And this is how we populate the data set. A little bit later on, we'll take we'll go into a little more detail into the data sets. The next field we'll look at is the, the destination Mac. You can see here that this is the default as per the, the standard. This is not mandatory, this is optional. However, the, the standard recommends to use this. Always make sure that the the second the the, the first octet has a, a zero one. If this is set as zero zero, then it's not multicast. Um, so the destination MAC is used by the network to restrict the delivery message. Um, if we switch this over, if we switch this goose type over to a a routable goose, then this get this field gets grayed out, and we use a different field. More about that later. The next field that we'll look at is the priority. So the priority is used to determine which goose messages will be delivered first in the event of heavily loaded networks. So the range here is 0 to 7, where 7 is the highest priority and 0 is the lowest, and 4 is the default. There's also a dynamic feature where there's a range And what this represents is the, this is the, the dynamic feature where the, the first event message has the user priority value of the first digit 
and the user priority is decremented in each following message until reaching the value of the second digit. So in a case like this where we have, say, for instance, we select 75, then what happens is the, the first time the message is, uh, it's the first time the event is acknowledged, it sends it with a priority of 7. Then on the next one, it reduces to 6. And then subsequently after that, it decrements to number 5. On a final note, the higher priority messages should be set in a range between 4 to 7. Next, we'll look at the VLAN ID. This is the virtual LAN number. So the value entered sets the, the VLAN value as per the IEEE 802.1Q. Uh, the VLAN tag is included in the published Goose messages. Uh, the VLAN can be used uh, by network devices direct message to only select the devices, reducing the network burden. Um, the range here is 0 to 4095. Zero 01 are assigned by the IEEE 802.1Q to other functions and are not to be used for the Goose messages. So let's go ahead and just we'll set this to 4. In this field, the E-type app ID, uh, we need to fill this field because this is also entered into the, the Goose message and it's used by the subscribers to, do, to discriminate it from other Goose messages. The standard range from 0 to 16,383 is typically reserved for Goose Type 1 fast messages and reserves the value range of 32,768 to 41,151 for Goose Type 1A, which are trip messages. Now, some subscribers can process the messages of a type 1A range faster than messages in a type 1 range. So here the standard basically says if, if we have a default value of 0, then there's a lack of configuration. So the standard strongly recommends putting something in here. So since we've got a trip set up here, why don't we just set this up for, for 32,768, seeing how it's going to be, how we have our data set set up as a trip. The configuration revision is, uh, so this is another thing that's published into the, the Goose message for subscribers to discriminate. And, and you can see the expected configuration revision of the message. Um, this is supposed to be updated every time you change the order or whether you uh, change the different types of uh, members that are located, say, in the data set. Um, the standard the value of zero is reserved, so you should be incrementing this anytime you make a change within the, the Goose message itself. Next, we'll look at the retransmission time. Since there isn't any feedback that the data has been received by the subscriber, we try to ensure the transmission of the data by repeatedly sending the message. So the range here is zero to 100 milliseconds. The default is four. The idea here is that when an event occurs, it will send it four times with a very specific pattern. If no events occur, then the message is still sent on a, in a, on a time interval based on the time specified here in the update time. So if no events occur, it will still send out a goose message at this interval. If, a, if a, an event occurs immediately, then it uses this interval. And now I'll show you the retransmission time. So if there's, no, if there's no activity, no events are being generated, the Goose message will still be sent out based on the update time setting. When an event occurs, the Goose message is sent immediately. Then again, it's resent within that time interval for the retransmission time. It's sent a third time with that same time interval, and then a fourth time where the time limit has been doubled. And then after that, it goes back to its standard update time at the time to live field. The standards requires that the subscribers assume a failure has occurred when the published Goose message is not received within the published time to live time. So the guideline for this is based on the update time times the number of continuous missed message deliveries. So as a rule of thumb, you can use the update time times three plus one. So for example, if the update time is set to 10 seconds, and you've missed up to three consecutive message messages, then the setting should be 10 times three plus one second, which makes it 31 seconds. 
The reason for the extra second is to ensure that the arrival of the third update time transmission beats the time allowed to live timer. The next thing we'll look at is the port assignment. As a means of security, this setting specifies the Ethernet ports for transmitting the goose message. We can pick and choose which port we can, we're going to transmit the goose message over. One, two, three, or any combination of the three ports. We can also disable the port for security purposes. Now, if you're using the PRP, any, any form of uh, redundancy, then you'll need to set this setting to port 2 and port 3. So in this setting, if you were to go in and look at the CID file, you would notice that there wouldn't be any port 3 configuration. Uh, the port 3 would have all the same elements as port 2, same MAC address, the IP address, and the masking. The next thing we'll look at is our group of uh, routable goose uh, settings here. To enable these, we'll change the setting of the mode from Goose to Ruttable Goose. And you can see that here now the destination MAC is, is grayed out. It's all gone to zeros. And the first thing we'll look at here is the, is the, the IP class. So this setting selects the IP uh, v4 differentiated service code point. Uh, it's formerly known as the type of service or TOS. This value provides the priority routing when supporting in the routers. The, the default value is for expedited forwarding, which is the value 46. There's no need to change this. The DST IP, this setting specifies the destination IP address for the routable goose. Uh, and the only thing we have to be aware of is that the IP address needs to be a valid multicast or unicast IP address. Now, one last thing before we complete this is as I hover over each one of these fields, you can see there, uh, you can see the logical the device and the logical nodes that each one of these fields are associated with. So here's the Goose uh, ID. You can see it's got the logical node of master, logical node zero, and then of course the, the Goose name. So anyways, this concludes this section. Next, we'll go into the RX goose. Before we leave the screen, I decided to come back and create a second goose with some analog values. So I've gone ahead and named the, the goose ID metered values. I left the control block name the same. Uh, I've entered in a new name for the, the TT3 uh, data set. I called it volts underscore current. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm going to come down to metering and I'm going to select the MMXU, it's right here, AC source MMXU1, I'm going to go down to the MX which is the metering and I'm just going to post in a, a voltage and a current, so we have the, the instantaneous or the or the, the other setting here that requires a dead band. So let's go with the dead band one. We have a magnitude and an angle. Let's go with the magnitude. We'll grab the, the floating point. We'll drag it over. So there we have it. Meter, AC source, MMXU1, MX volts, phase A, and this is the magnitude. And then I'll do the same thing with current as well. And then we'll save everything. Now, one of the things I need to be aware of with the TT3, that you cannot alter the name. You'll get this kind of an error message if you try and change the name. So you come back, we'll have to leave the TT3 prefix in here at the beginning, or else it won't acknowledge it. Now we can go ahead and save this.